The member for Bowman. Speaker, flanked by the member for Riverina and I'm sure supported on both sides of this chamber, I want to acknowledge the important work done by rural and remote health care providers right around this great nation. Whether they're working in rural towns or in remote communities, whether they're doctors, nurses or allied health workers, they are working to close the rural urban gap in health, which at the moment in life expectancy is between five and seven years. But something is certain about living in remote Australia. You should not have to take second class health care. And that is a commitment I know from this whole chamber. And I know also that if many of these regional towns and communities were in fact patients. They would be category one and wheeled straight in for emergency care of the highest quality. But too often we hand them a bag of cash and say, do your best to recruit a health worker without ever ensuring that those health workers are actually deployed. Uh, speaker, right now it is obstetrics. It's surgery and it's anaesthetics. It's those procedures done by our rural generals that actually hold the communities together, preventing people who live in remote Australia and rural Australia from having to uh, suffer delayed diagnosis, travel long distances for care and suffer the emotional and financial expense of what ensues. What we need, though, and we need more of, and I know it's again supported in this chamber, is more focus on rural training, more focus on incentives and, of course, a way of seeing our overseas trained doctors, who are the backbone in many cases of our medical workforce, being assisted and supported to not only deliver the services that we need but to be, feel like they are part of those rural communities. Now, we also tonight want to recognise the important work of two jurisdictions that are the most uh, dis dispersed and decentralised of all, and that is New South Wales and Queensland. And I want to acknowledge the work of the Queensland Government in having a rural training pathway for GPs that has become the model for the rest of Australia, the fact that they do give significant payments for professional development and recreational leave for their nurses twice a year in addition to bonuses which are extended to the allied health sector as well, and of course the well-known Queensland seven-tiered category payments to doctors to work in the most remote of locations between $6,900 and $48,300 per year, non pro rated and that is a very, very strong uh, attractant for getting our doctors predominantly trained in the cities to work for rural and remote Queensland. In New South Wales, they do it differently, and that's the benefit of a federalist system. And through their remote and rural incentive scheme, they offer up to $10,000 payments, not just to health, but to human services workers, education and training, the police, the fireys and the SES. And of course, we also see that they're offering significant study incentives for a semester every three years, four hours a week to do additional study, and that maintains the intellectual and training connection to urban centres. There are payments to VMOs of up to $10,000 and for dentists of up to $20,000 in New South Wales, which innovatively can be used not only to pay for a vehicle or for travel expenses, but even pay school tuition fees. So here are two states doing things differently but effectively, but it's still not enough. There are three big frontiers ahead of us. The first one is incorporating the overseas trained doctors who still remain the backbone of service in some of these communities. And they need to have an opportunity in some of the cases their families, to be able to access public education and health facilities, but they can't even though they're supporting the communities in those areas. Second, we need an advanced rural training pathway that says to young doctors, we will take you from the point at which you're deciding whether or not to be a specialist and offer you a procedural based general practice in the bush which is inspiring and satisfying and in a way that can allow you to do procedures because it's a skill that is dying in the bush and a procedural training pathway that offers them a qualification and a college qualification at the end of it would be vitally important. And last, and I hate to lament this, there has been fiddling of the geographic classification standard by the current Labor federal government that has led to pooling of communities of completely different uh, geography into five simplified categories. Now, I can understand that there is a need for an uh, uh, academically developed system for remoteness. All I ask on behalf of rural doctors around this country and those who are training to be one is remember it's not just geography alone. I know you may well be an equal distant from a major centre, but you cannot class Gundagai as the same as Wagga with a teaching specialist hospital. Otherwise, the doctors in Gundagai move to Wagga, and it's utterly counterproductive, but the payments are now the same. Huge numbers of coastal Queensland doctors are now receiving incentives that are not much less than working in a place like Cloncurry. Speaker, why would you remain in Cloncurry? So I ask the obvious question, why should Ingham be like Townsville? Why should Bustleton, Bendigo, Wagga and Gundagai all be in the same category as Hobart? 
This is a major metropolitan centre with a completely different challenge of remoteness. If we can fix up the issues for overseas trained doctors and their families and support them, look after this geographic classification scheme and take some action as an incentive, we can ensure rural and remote health service delivery occurs for Australia. Order.